We'll open up our hymnals now to hymn number 726 as we sing Spirit of the Living God. And let us stand as we sing this. <laughs> passage as we look at we are coming up on mission fast and so it's good to think over and over of the work of missions and the missions we support and uh, around the world through this denomination through our offerings uh, we can do more together than we could alone and so we're thankful that God has placed us and, and even being a part of a denomination is an example the communion of saints which we confessed a little while ago but here we find the foundation of why we go out with missions and that is also found in this text. Hear God's word as we look at it together. Then he called his 12 disciples to go together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money, and do not have two, two, two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust of your feet, feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed. Because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. And Herod said, John, I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the central purpose of the church, of what we do as a church, is not only right here of, of worshiping the triune God, uh, but on this side of eternity, we have a task that we are to be serious about, and that is the work of missions. This is our God-given privilege to share the treasures of God's grace with others, to encourage others to know the God we know, to repent of sin, believe, and worship Him. We didn't come to this on our own. For Jesus commands us to make disciples of all nations. The point is to make followers and worshipers for Christ. That's the point of discipleship. That's the point of missions. And this is, this is all of our tasks together. It's not just the pastor. It's not just the missionaries we support. And I'm thankful to God while there's always room for improvement. Our church is invested in this. Because we know people are lost without the hearing and believing the gospel that God saves sinners like us in Jesus Christ. And so we support missions with our offerings. We have elders that serve on various times in the missions committees. Others go uh, to mission trips to the Dominican Republic. And, and you've supported my being on the various mission committees and going to Central Africa three times in the last eight years. And yes, with these things, we can, we can think, you know, it, it seems like it's a crazy thing that people would, would give up their vacation time, that they would travel at risk to themselves, that they would sacrifice for their families, or the families would make sacrifice, or that the church would make sacrifices, and the person themselves would even go to distant 
dangerous lands. But we're not doing this because we think it's fun. This is Christ's call. Not just for the 12 apostles, not just for pastors, but for every Christian to, to see this world. This world is mission field. In fact, I've been thinking about it too, that we used to have a banner back there. We need, we need to get that up or update it or whatever. Because we enter the mission field from here. We are God's workers taking the good news of Jesus Christ as Savior to those in our family, to those we study with, those we work with, our neighbors, even those we, we just happen across in this life. And, and God is placing us with them to proclaim the good news of His saving grace. And we do that humbly. And when God the Son called and gifted and sent his men to preach the kingdom of God. We need to see not everything is exactly the same for us, but many of those, many of the lessons we need to learn and apply are here in this text for us. And so let's ask ourselves, when Jesus commands missions, is that all he does? Just go do it, right? You know, this is important to think about because when, when we think of missions, this is not an area that we feel equipped for. To be honest, even myself as a preacher, I, don't, I often feel like Moses in Exodus 4.10, who said he was of slow speech. I grew up with speech therapists and tutors galore and struggling through school. <coughs> the reality is it's easy for each one of us to think, you know what, God could have found a hundred different, better ways to share the gospel than through me. He could have an angel appear. He, he, we could have multiple appearances of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ appear over and over, and frankly, you'd do a much better job than we could. And amazingly and mercifully enough, Jesus calls his disciples. Think of who these men were. Men with all sorts of different sins. Men that we probably would call today blue-collar workers. They were not trained in speech or debate, but notice what verse 1 tells us. He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Now, we might feel a certain power in ourselves. We, we understand what power is as we sit there in our throne in the easy chair with, with that little box that controls a bigger box as we flip through channels and, and watch uh, you know, multiple things at once, or we think we can See, there, maybe that is proof that guys can focus on more things than once uh, for women. I don't know, you know, because we try to watch a couple shows at once sometimes. But, you know, the reality is we, we can hand off that remote, but, but we can't hand off power from ourselves. Yet the amazing thing is God's own son, Jesus, has such power that he can share that power. He shared it with his apostles and he shares it with you and I. The scripture tells us in Ephesians 3.16 that Jesus grants you and I, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirits. And other uh, spirit, sorry, it's one spirit. <laughs> in other words, the Lord strengthens us for the Christian life. That's what it's talking about. And part of that includes missions. Here, Jesus sent the disciples into the world like ours. He sent his disciples to people like us. To people like they had been, where they were. Which need the good news of the gospel. With, with people that were full of religion. I mean, our society, even though as we're rejecting God, we're full of religion. It's just our own man-made religion. And people are full of emptiness. We just got to look around. We see it. We want to entertain ourselves to death to avoid that empty feeling, Right? You come in a room, you got to turn on the radio, turn on your phone. Actually, I shouldn't say radio anymore. we got iHeart Radio. we got all sorts of internet radios and things like that. We're in a world full of heartache and disappointment, full of people that are wounded, ravaged by sin, filled with concern and shame. And Jesus sent his disciples into such a world and gave them a 
power and authority to go. And this is important because you think about it, there's authority in this world. Police officers have authority uh, to stop gang violence. But if they don't have backup, they don't have the power, right? Or if they're not supported by the higher-ups, they don't have the power to stop crime. The apostles were given, though, both power and the right to show the world the kingdom of God had come in full force. And at times, like with Moses and with Elijah and Elisha, and now the apostles, God granted such dynamic miracle-working power so that there would be no doubt that God was behind this message at these pinnacle moments of God's redemption. And notice, that's why, you notice too, miracles are just, the Bible is not filled with miracles. God still can miraculously work. We should not doubt that. But it's only in times of great moments of redemption that God just unleashed his power, and particularly with Christ himself as God the Son, and, and he gives that power to through his disciples for a short time. Here he is, here, and, and notice here, he's choosing the 12. Later he'll pick the 70 in the next chapter. And not only show how his, his work is, is ever multiplying and, and showing us too that it doesn't just stop with the apostles. It comes out to, to us, and it's our responsibility. But also here, he picks the 12 to make the point that Revelation 21, 13 tells us that the 12 apostles are the foundation or the pillars of the New Testament church. They're teaching. Their faith, just like the 12 patriarchs were in the Old Testament age. Our work is based on theirs, and theirs on Christ. Now, God never calls us or commands us to do something without giving us the power to accomplish what he commands. And that's what we see here. Like the disciples for whom Jesus sent his power, or sent, it, sent through his spirit, we also have the same spirit, the same resources for proclaiming the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 8 says this. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. A lot of things to be afraid about in this year, or about in this life. Even afraid for the future. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. But of power and love and of a sound mind, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. I'm not talking about this testimony that we have received. In part, that's true. But it's also about our testimony of the Lord before this world. God has given us his Holy Spirit to believe him, but also to proclaim his word boldly. As one missionary said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary, missionary we must become. Now, what type of missions work does Jesus empower and give them? Well, verse 2 tells us he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Jesus doesn't form, send them off to form some sort of political action committee, to clean up the environment, or promote virtues and morals. That's not the church's purpose. Even though we might wish for it, particularly with both of our presidential candidates, that morals and virtues would, would be cleaned up. Now Jesus sends his disciples out with a ministry of the word and deed. And the first task that they're to be is to be preachers, to preach the truth of God's word, that, that this life is not all that there is. There is a judgment, and we owe to God perfect obedience. And yet he's also given us his son for that obedience and for our salvation. And you think about it in the word and you look at the rest of the Bible too and even before, God sets the highest value on the preaching of the word of God. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the preaching of the word of God. By this, you think about it, the lost are saved. That's, that seems crazy. God uses the foolishness of the world the foolishness of preaching is what God has ordained to save this world, as we read from our responsive reading. 
And what we learn from God's word through the preaching is, as Ephesians 4.12 tells us, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, so preaching is to feed the body of Christ and help equip you to declare all the things about this kingdom of God and about the reign of God over this universe and over human hearts to bring salvation full and free to sinners like us. We have to declare this before the day of the wrath of the Lamb, which Revelation 6, 15 through 17 tells us is coming. When Jesus will come again to judge the world in righteousness. Then, after that, the work of missions will cease. There will be no more opportunities for repentance and faith. But now, for now, you know, think about it. In heaven, I'm going to be out of a job. That's a good thing. You'll have the perfect teacher. But preaching and teaching God's word is of first importance. But notice, too, here, there is ministering to people's physical needs, too, with deeds of mercies to back up the ministry of the word. Because we're not merely to care for people spiritually, but also physically. And it's hard to hear the gospel when you have true pangs of hunger. You see that in the Dominican. I saw that in the Congo. Where at best they ate one meal a day. At best. This is why we have diaconal works too as a denomination. In fact, right now, you, I mean, we have, it's to be published yet, hopefully in the Reformed Herald, but right now we have palm trees and chickens being shipped in, in the Congo. In fact, we think we have problems with flooding. Actually, that's what's happening. The palm trees are waiting because there's a bridge that's, bridge that's washed out right now. They're going to make palm oil. But they're being shipped in the Congo to help churches feed themselves, to make money to live, and to support their pastors. All things that this passage talks about. See, we can't, and, and while we just can't do good for people either, we can't flip that around too and say, well, well, missions is just about being good. We also have to realize missions comes with the ministry of the word. Because we minister, we can't really minister to people's souls, though without ministering to their needs also. We do both. We can't just do something good without preaching the word. We can't just preach the word without doing something for their, for their uh, physical needs. Both go hand in hand. Otherwise, it's not missions. And we also should always see the good we do for others is to be the door for the gospel. A, a purposeful, intended opportunity to show the goodness of God. He's blessed us, and so we want to be blessed a blessing also to others. He's blessed us with the forgiveness of sins, with a care for who we are. And we're called to reflect that. In fact, 1 Peter 4.10 tells us, as each one has received a gift, gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God's given you a gift. He's gifted you. Just as he did the disciples. He's saying use it. Lastly, what will the response be to Jesus? Well, Jesus in verse 3 gives the disciples a one-time command to take nothing extra uh, with them. And that's why there's some differences in the different accounts because uh, maybe some of the guys had staffs and Jesus is telling others not to go back and get staffs and maybe some guys had stuff and Jesus is saying, go as you are, it's urgent, go now. Later in Luke twenty two thirty six, Jesus will tell them to be prepared with a money bag and, and knapsack and even prepared to protect themselves. But for now, Jesus is wanting them to rely on, on God's provisions for the support of their works. Then in verse 4, they're to, be connect, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're to be content and they're not to go from house to house just because someone's able to provide better for them than, than somebody else before. And the whole point that Jesus is pushing them is as he's given them gifts, they're to lean on God's providential care as we should in this life. This is true for preachers. But really everyone should be careful not to become too invested materially in this world. Because God will provide. He can provide in amazing ways through unexpected ways. Think of how God provided for Elijah. When he was, he, he thought he was done. God fed Elijah by the ravens, as 1 Kings 17 shows us. 
God will take care of us. In fact, right before Jesus went to the cross, he asked them about this. In Luke 22, Jesus said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. Jesus is making the point, even as we go into this world telling others about the kingdom of God, in his good providence, God will take care of us. Yeah, we might not have what other people have, but he will take care of us with what we need. And so our response to Christ's command has to be one of faith. And that's what the disciples here. They were told to go out in faith, but not all will believe. Jesus prepares them and also for us for rejection. It's not just about us. That's why. That's not the only reason people are rejecting the gospel. It's the gospel. Some reject the gospel. They reject Jesus. Verse 9 tells us, and, whenever, and whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. The rabbis taught the, the Jews that, that when they came back in from the Gentile lands, they were, were to shake the dust off their feet as a sign uh, of condemnation against them. That was never commanded by God. Here Jesus turns that around so that any Jew watching watching the disciples might be convicted and be forced to think and repent that as they reject the gospel, they're no better than the Gentiles. With this too, we see unbelief. We see that response too. There's unbelief of Herod, who murdered John, whose guilty conscience was starting to get to him. Others were also asking, who is this Jesus? These responses are to be expected, and and, and we should let people wrestle with these questions, particularly when someone like Herod asked the questions, because frankly, he wasn't looking for the truth. He, He wanted to preserve his own kingdom, his own things, rather than be humbled before the king of kings, and there's people in our world that are like that too. And to do the work of missions, we don't have to answer every request or go down every rabbit trail that people might go down. That's why Jesus never went to Herod, either to assuage his guilt or curiosity. Our work is missions, though, no matter what the response might be. And brothers and sisters in Christ, verse 6 tells us the disciples obeyed Jesus' command. Why? Well, as John Calvin reminds us, the gospel does not fall from the clouds like rain by accident, but is brought by the hands of men to where God has sent it. How's the gospel going to go out from here? See, it takes more than idle curiosity to be a Christian. We're called to obey. We're called to repent and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of sinners. We need to do more than just take a look at Jesus. We need to come to the right conclusion about him, knowing for sure that he is our Savior. And once we do, we are to want and we will want and are sent that others might know Jesus too. Jesus has called and gifted and sent not just the disciples, but you and I. Not in the exact same context, not in the exact same way as the apostles were, but with the same purpose, to go everywhere. Wherever lost people are, wherever we can gain a hearing of the gospel, this needs to be our passion. And and this is to be the heartbeat of the church. We don't do this alone or by our own strength or wisdom. We do this in the power of the Spirit and the authority of his name to preach the gospel and to reach people with the love of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your command to us here and many other places on this on this subject is very clear. Help us to be burdened by the loss that are around us in this dying world so that we would be, so that we could not help but to go speak and love those around us with the love you have given to us, with the hope of your salvation, your kingdom. Equip us, embolden us with this, the most important words our, our, our lips could ever take up, the, the most important message we will ever tell anyone. Give us the grace and strength, whether it be to speak to our family or to walk to the next desk in the office or even to walk the dusty streets of Kinshasa. Help us go with the gospel, not wait for unbelievers to seek us. Strengthen us for this glorious task. 
Help us see this is the king's task. The rulers will rise and fall. But you will stand. And you have given us this task, and, and we ask that you would enable us, unleash our hearts, our wallets, our lips, our times, that this may be our focus, that we might glorify you, and that others would be drawn to, to glorify you as well. Make up for our shortcomings in our, when we talk and when we share with others. Help us to see that you will do that. We pray this in Jesus, the Lord, the King.